just go ahead and start. Good morning. Is it say it louder than that. Good morning. <laughs> we are glad you are with us today. If you didn't get signed in with Church Center, or if you are a visitor, please fill out the tear off in the bulletin and place it in the offering plate or boxes near the exits. For those of you watching online, remember to check in on the online check-in tab. You can go to our website and look under resources to get today's bulletin with all the information. All right, Tyler, the flowers are placed on the altar today in the sanctuary. They're given to the glory of God in loving memory of Daryl Rowland by his dear wife, Lucy Rowland, who will probably be watching today at 11 o'clock. Family night stu suppers are Wednesday nights at 5.15 p.m., followed by the We Believe program at 6. There will be a yellow reservation cards on the tables near the doors to fill out and sign up for supper. You may place them in the offering plate or boxes, or you may call the church office by 2 o'clock p.m. on Mondays. There will be a new Tuesday morning Bible study for women. You are never alone. It's led by Lillian Wysong. And it begins September 7th, so please let us know, and then you can know to be a part of that and also purchase the book. As COVID cases are back on the rise, we want to let you know we are taking precautions as a church. We also encourage you to consider being vaccinated if you have not been. And on a cleaning note, two things. I want, I want to fix Tyler's hair right there. It's, he's got, <laughs> and if that was my kid, I would lick my hand, Bill, <laughs> but I'm... Um, just not going to do that. And so, um, so I've been using the water from my, my Coke cup to do that. But it does look better. It looks better, Tyler. All right. Um, Ron Leverett is on leave following surgery, so we'd appreciate it if you would pick up around you the best that you can. Um, if you're willing to serve in our church and additional help, please call the church office. We had somebody come in this week, and um, they dusted every piece of wood in this sanctuary. It took them about two and a half hours. And she said, I need some time by myself. And it was the most wonderful two and a half hours I've had in a long, long, long time. So that was a great blessing to her and also a blessing to you and a blessing to us. Um, she dusted every piece of wood in the building. Please take note of all the other announcements in your bulletin so you don't miss anything important. And lastly, we want to say welcome to our visitors. We're glad you're here. Thank you for being a part of our church service and our worship family today. Um, please make sure and fill out one of those cards and so that we can acknowledge you being here with us. Um, there's many other announcements. Please take note of those throughout this week and we will begin our service. If everyone would stand up and let's greet each other um, from a distance and then we wait and wave at those online, wave at the camera folks. They're in their pajamas and they think it's funny that you're not. And so then let us pray together if we could. We need to. Will you go to the sound booth and take this up some? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your presence with us today. Lord, bless our time. Bless this service along with 10 and 11 o'clock. And may we honor you in all that we do and say. In Christ's holy and wonderful name we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
and then make you want to go, whoo. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you. All right, I want you to turn to your worship, guys. We're going to stand and sing Blessed Assurance, and when we all get to heaven, let's stand and sing together. Good morning, everyone. You guys got to say good morning back. Good morning. good morning. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we have some prayer requests and concerns this morning. Um, but first, I can tell you that yesterday we fully moved Evelyn into um, UNG, and she's in the cadet program. She was a teenager that had been living with us for the past few months, and uh, that was a tearjerker, you guys. I did not expect it to hit us that hard, but it did. So if you would just pray for her this week as she adjusts, her classes start on Monday. So she's excited but also nervous, so just keep her in your prayers. Um, on the first line, on the back of your bulletin, you can look along with me. We want to be praying for Charlie Higgins, Cindy Pace and family, Jack Edmonds, who he's home now, Connie Volrath, our Stephen Ministry Care Receivers and Caregivers, the HFUMC Preschool, Hart County Schools, Essential Workers, and also Unspoken Requests. Um, I got to sub in the preschool on Friday, and they are amazing. But those teachers, man, they got to have a lot of patience. So just, you know, add them in there because that was tough. That was a tough morning for me. 
Um, we also want to be in prayer for Haywood County in North Carolina. They've had a lot of flooding and some deaths due to that, and I think that's near Moorhead City area. Um, if you will look at the extended prayer needs and um, keep those in front of you and in your memory. And then on the other prayer needs, we have a few new ones on our list. The first one would be Sam Ahmadi and family. That was Jason Ford's interpreter in Afghanistan. Then Alicia Galfin, daughter-in-law of Shet and Jane Womack. Glenn Barbie the friend of Jim and Susan Montgomery, Glenn Harrison, friend of Cindy Smith, Ann Witted, the friend of Harriet Hodgkin, uh, David Beaver, the stepdad of Jimmy Grease, Greeson, Karen Zabella Sanacor, the daughter of Jan and Ken Z Zabella, and then lastly on this part of the list, Will Chafin, the son of Bill and Kay Chafin. And then um, take this home with you. Keep going through this throughout the week as you have your devotional time and pray for these folks. Then lastly, we want to extend our Christian love and sympathy to Karen Wells upon the death of her husband, Christopher Price. Joy Shaw and family upon the death of her husband, Lanier Shaw. Reverend Dean and Mrs. Jean Kring and family in the death of her brother, Monroe Curl Irving Golden, senior who passed away recently. And then Dr. Theodore and Sherilyn Shock and family in the death of her mother, Sarah Ethleen Thompson, who passed away recently. Now let us pray together. Dear God, we thank you so much um, for all of the people gathered in this church this morning. Lord, I pray that throughout the next week, that as we go home and into our own places of ministry and work, that you would help us to remember these names. As we reflect on them and think of them, God, I pray that you would help us to continue to remember to send prayers up to you for them. And we know with confidence that you hear those prayers and that you are right there with those people. And now we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Okay, let's sing some more. Shall we gather at the river and on Jordan's stormy banks I stand? Let's stand together.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for all that you give us, for your faithfulness to us. Help us to honor you through our tithes, our offerings, and our sacrifice as we place our hearts in these boxes here or in these plates. In the wonderful and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
Good morning. Make sure my, my lapel is on. There we go. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see everybody. Um, we had, we've had crazy weather this week. It rained, and then it would be clear, and then we had a football game Friday night, and we beat Elbert by a whole bunch, and that always makes everyone feel better. And then we had, but Franklin County right down the road, they had a, more than an hour delay. And so we were able to, to have ours, and that was great. And, and so we've got lots of things. Cross Country had worked all day. There was no prediction of rain, nothing. They had worked all day at the Hartwell Golf Club getting everything ready. They'd spent hours and hours and hours putting up all the things. And then at 6 o'clock, they had six teams headed this way, and it was going to start. No, it was going to start at 6. So about 5 o'clock, they were getting here. What I was two hours away, and they called and said, Hold off, don't come, and not a single one of them. All teams sat in their cars, and that was it. They couldn't run that night because of lightning and rain and all that kind of stuff. And so they'll have to reschedule that. So it's just the way it is right now. And so we certainly want to pray for all of our brothers and sisters in North Carolina and, and throughout the area that's had all this terrible flooding. Goodness, did y'all see the pictures of Helen, Georgia the other day? Um, that restaurant that we all sit at right over the river, the water was above the, the line there and all up into the tables and everything. And so it's been kind of nuts. We, as, as Amanda said, we got Evelyn off to school. She's kind of like our kid. And she had a group of about 35 cadets in her small group. There were um, six groups and she was only one of two females in her group, and there was a retired Army colonel there that was working with the cadets, and he came up to Amanda and Calvin and said, I just want to tell you that your daughter, that's what he said, your daughter is incredible, and she has a tremendous future um, in the military, and we're just proud of her. Um, they, of course, said, she's not our daughter, and so we're... You know, but Amanda and Calvin just sobbed. They were like um, sobbing. But um, we left Ashton yesterday, my youngest daughter in Augusta, and she starts, um, she's got one more year of school and graduate work, and she'll end up being a doctor. And I don't know what that means. That's just scary to me. And um, she cried like a baby, too. So that's just the way it is. Um, and Tracy and I cried as we left, and she's with her husband, but. Um, She'll be back with us again in the spring as she has one more clinical to do. And, of course, it is her last one, and, of course, it is in Anderson. And so she'll be back with us in the springtime. It's a lot of craziness going on. Um, good things, though, but good things. Just, just want to remind you, if you would look at our prayer concerns, um, Karen Wells, I talked to her this week. She and her husband had only been married since the summer, and he was in his mid-50s, and he died of covid um, terribly sad, just all of these deaths, just a horrible. Um, uh, Meredith O'Neill called me Friday, and the hospital where she works, um, North Fulton, is absolutely full, um, and they had two deaths last week in their 30s and had an 18-year-old that died Friday. And just, just sad. Just, and I talked to Jim Martin, a member of our church, he was not feeling good, so he went to the hospital at, George, at Gwinnett Medical Center. Of course, there's no rooms. There are no rooms in ICU. There are no rooms um, here and even in Livonia. They're having to send them to Tacoa. And so Jim sat out on a gurney, laid out on a gurney in the hall six and a half hours until they could find a room to put him in. And so just uh, all I can say is to you, be careful, um, be careful, be careful, be careful. And so we just want to do the best that we can. I'm talking about baptism today, and I've got my baptism fountain, and I want to encourage folks to touch the water. And so I had this grand idea this morning that I would put alcohol in the water just so you could say it's not going to hurt you. Well, I didn't know alcohol would foam up. And so it, I, I promise you I did not put soap in the water. It is alcohol um, stuff so that if you would like to remember your baptism at the close of this service, I invite you to do that. Um, there's a beautiful fountain right outside Broad Street in Augusta, Georgia, and some friends of mine, I, I, I don't know who they were or are, but they would take um, Dawn dish, roping, dish sir, um, stuff 
and put like five or six bottles in that fountain at various times during the year. And I can still remember, Ben Moore, a picture of that fountain. And you could not even see the entire half block because they had put so much detergent in that. And um, I can't imagine anybody doing that. I really can't. And I'm not going to tell you who did it. All right. Um, let's talk about today. We're going to talk about baptism and what that means for us. Also what it means for us as Methodists and what it means in other denominational understandings as well. I've got several other scriptures other than what's in the bulletin. I, I want to share just briefly with you about the baptism of Jesus. We usually recognize that Sunday in January, but I just wanted to mention it to you just so that you can get a clear understanding of where we come from in our Protestant um, with the understanding of what it means as far as um, our sacraments. Matthew 3, 13 through 17. You may want to take some notes on this as well, but Matthew 3, 13 through 17. At that time, Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan River so that John would baptize him. John tried to stop him and said, I need to be baptized by you, yet you come to me. And Jesus answered in verse 15, allow me to be baptized now. This is necessary to fulfill all righteousness. So John agreed to baptize Jesus. When Jesus was baptized, he immediately came up out of the water. Heaven was open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God coming down like a dove and resting upon him. A voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I dearly love. I find happiness in him. Now, the same story happens in Mark, Mark 1, 9 through 11. About that time, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. There's not the argument seen in the Gospel of Mark. While he was coming up out of the water, Jesus saw heaven splitting open, and the Spirit, like a dove, coming down upon him. And there was a voice from heaven that said, You are my Son, whom I dearly love, in you I find happiness. Notice who God is talking to. Who's God talking to? Who? Jesus. Remember, there are other times on the, the Mount of Transfiguration where Jesus talks to the disciples that went up on top of the mountain. But here, God is talking to Jesus himself. In you, I find happiness. Now, Mark includes this in such a powerful way where it says Jesus saw heaven splitting open because Mark ties it in to the, the crucifixion narrative where Mark 15.38 says, the word is eketh, and it means the temple veil splitting open. Remember, the temple veil split, and it separated the holy from, from the profane. And so what Mark is doing is tying the baptism into the death and eventually resurrection of Jesus. And so Jesus saw the heavens splitting open, and the Spirit of God coming down and descending upon him like a dove. Luke 3, 21 and 22, when everyone was being baptized, Jesus also was baptized. While he was praying, heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit came down on him in bodily form like a dove. And there was a voice from heaven that said, you are my son, whom I dearly love. In you, I find, guess what last word is? Happiness. This is the common English version that I'm using this morning, but in you, I find happiness. And, and that's a question we ask ourselves when we look up to heaven and heaven split open. Um, does God say within us? Because Jesus dwells within us if we believe what we say we believe. So does God say to us and you, I find happiness. In John, a little bit different. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one about whom I've said, he who comes after me is really greater than me because he existed before me. Remember John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the word and the word was God and the word was with God. So John ties in the baptismal story with um, his creation narrative from the very first part of his chapter. Even I didn't recognize him, but I came baptizing with water so that he might be made known to Israel. John testified, I saw the Spirit coming down from heaven like a dove, and it rested upon him. And it rested upon him. So those are some powerful verses that remind us that Jesus was baptized. We, we believe that there are two sacraments 
um, in the Methodist church and also in all Protestant churches. Those two sacraments are baptism and also Holy Communion. Now, the differences in many of our churches and denominational differences is how we administer the sacraments. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit. But I want to remind you as well, the text in our bulletin, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Jesus came near and spoke to them. I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until this present age, till the end of this present age. And so Jesus says, you receive the Holy Spirit and you go out. Last week we talked about the Holy Spirit and how we have gifts of grace. Today we're talking about baptism and how baptism defines in us and is a defining moment for us as Christian believers. 1 Peter 3.21, baptism is like that. It saves you now, not because of it removes dirt from your body, but because it is the mark of a good conscience towards God. Your salvation comes through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And for all this, this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now, as I said, methodology is different in different churches and in different denominations. I, I, I googled because that's um, what we do. And so I googled the differences in Methodist and Baptist. And, oh, dear Lord, I got the most craziness stuff. Something like two million, you know, pages I could have looked at. I read every single one of them. And so it said stuff that Baptists don't believe. It said stuff that Methodists don't believe. The first couple of pages had us all wrong and them all wrong and then um, had Presbyterians thrown in there just for the heck of it and, and all this craziness, this craziness. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about why we do things differently. We do things differently because we believe a little bit differently. Now, remember, 85 to 90 percent of Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Lutherans, Episcopals, um, Catholic, um, Lutherans, and everybody else that is of the Christian faith, 90, 85 to 90 percent of all of the stuff that we believe is all the same. They're the basics of Christianity. We believe in the Trinity. We believe in the, the holy birth of Jesus. We believe that Jesus was fully God and fully human. We believe in all those things. It's all the same. The difference is how we do things and how we operate our governance and also whether we th see things as ordinance or sacrament. Now, we all believe as Protestants in two sacraments. You know, the Roman Catholics have more than that. But we believe, after the Reformation, that, that there were just two that Jesus participated in. Um, he did go to a wedding. Now, we know that, and we know that some other things. But we believe, as Protestants, that there are just two. He participated in two sacraments. What are they? Baptism and what else? Holy Communion. Now, in, in, in churches like Methodist churches, um, remember, I've, I've told you this before. We have an altar rail that separates the sacred from the profane. The sacred is beyond the altar rail and up. It, it becomes sacred space because this is the, the communion table and it's where we lay the elements of communion and where they are blessed by God. Um, the baptismal font in most Methodist churches is up here near the pulpit or also down by the altar rail. Where is it in the Catholic church? Do you remember? For those of you that grew up Catholic, where is it? It's in the front. That's right. It's right by the front door. Usually if the door is here, it's usually to the right, okay? In most churches, a baptismal font. It's pretty big, pretty good size, very ornate. The reason it's in the front is because Catholics view baptism as the entrance into your faithful story. Now, we as Protestants, we take that a little bit differently. Um, now, we have a lot of our churches have split pulpits. We have the pulpit on the right side and the lectern on the other because in many Protestant understandings, um, the Bible is a little bit separated from the preaching. And many of us, especially um, Baptist churches, the pulpit is center, center because preaching is the primary function. 
Now, many Methodist churches, my home church has a split pulpit. It has, um, the pulpit is a little higher than the lectern. It's usually done for two reasons. Number one, so people can hear because when the churches were built, they didn't have sound systems. And number two, um, the word being interpreted is seen in many Protestant churches as so very important. But also, we have to be very careful. Our, churches, our church here has two crosses, which usually... Most churches only have one, but we do that because somebody bought this and somebody put that in. Um, if you remember older, church, older pictures of our sanctuary, there was never a cross behind me. What was there? Do you remember? For those of you that grew up in this church, I don't know. When, when did they put this cross, Sam? Do you know? Um, but this has been here a long time. I'm not saying it's not, but there used to just be a curtain, a curtain back here. And there was a, a brass altar rail, right? Do you remember when they put, that was way before, that was long, long ago. But I've seen a picture because, Richard, you gave me a picture before the cross was placed there. Now, my home church had a cross on the altar table and had nothing in the back wall. And then they decided they want a big cross. That's what they wanted. And I, I remember the Sunday as if it were yesterday. My grandfather came in, sat down for lunch, and said, well, I don't know what's so much about that cross. There's nothing rugged about it. <laughs> and so for him, he needed a rugged cross. Of course, we're not going to put a rugged cross um, in the church. But y'all are a dead group today because that was, that was, I mean, you should laugh at that. I laughed at that. My grandmother laughed at that, said, oh, Alton, hush. I mean, that's what she always said to him. So you see, the focus should always be the cross. We should always focus on the cross. Now, baptism for us is important. It's behind the rail. Now, remember I've told you this story too. The, where did the altar rail come from? Well, basically it's a fence. That's what this is. And it was a fence placed in medieval churches to separate the holy elements of communion, wine and bread, so that dogs and other vermin and other critters that came in the front door would not eat the elements of Holy Communion. That's what it was for. But over time, it got incorporated into our philosophy of faith. And so then for us as, as Anglicans, as Methodists, um, we just incorporate it into our structure and it is the separating point. That's why you come for Holy Communion. We're going to talk another Sunday about Holy Communion. But that's why you come forward in the Methodist Church because you... The, the everybody lives in the profane and what you do is you come to the sacred and this is where you meet the sacred at the chancel the chancel is where it's sacred this is holy it's only holy because of what we do there but it becomes holy and this is where we bless the elements of holy communion we believe in the apostolic connection between the pastor all the way going back through john wesley and then all the way going back to jesus and we believe that the pastor that is ordained by the body is ordained to administer sacrament, Holy Communion. Um, I am ordained to word and order um, and um, word and table. That's what I'm ordained for, preaching and serving the sacraments. We don't believe that, that, that just anybody can serve, can bless the sacraments. That's just what we believe. A friend of mine goes to a church and they believe in self-baptism and they baptize their kid every time they go out to swim. That's all fine and good, but that's not what we believe. We believe that through the essence and the power in Holy Communion, pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and the blood of Christ. We do a thanksgiving over the water, the same thing. It's, for us, is sacramental. Um, for churches that are self-governing, like in the Baptist church, every Baptist church selects their own pastor. Um, they select the own man, their own man and woman that will serve that church, their pastor. In our organizational structure, I am not a member of this church. I am chosen by a bishop that goes through a cabinet, and y'all are stuck with me. Um, in, our, in our system, I've got guaranteed appointment. It doesn't matter what I do. I get to go to a church. Now, what you know as well as I do, that if I mess up and do something bad, then I won't stay here very long. <laughs> um, I've got several things saved from my last Sunday. But anyway, um, 
and you know how our system works. We, we move up and down, and that's just what we do. Um, and I've been here a long time. I've been here 18 years, and I have wanted to be here 18 years, and you know how all that works too. Some of you do, some of you don't. Um, let me just remind you how our system works. Staff Parish Relations Committee, that's Lou Ann Burgess back there. Um, wave Lou Ann. She's the chairperson of that committee. They will evaluate um, how I am doing in listening to the congregation. But I also evaluate you. And she fills out a sheet that says, we want him or her back. Or, no, the first one is we must have him or her back. The second one says, we'll take him or her back, but if there's somebody that's better, we'll take them. The third one says, we would prefer not to have him or her back, but if we're stuck with them, we'll keep with them. The fourth one says, get him or her out of here. All right, those are the four options that she has or that we have as a church. I have the same option. I must stay because it's very important. I'm willing to go, but if I got to stay, it's okay. I don't want to stay, but if I got to stay, it's okay. Get me the heck out of here, okay? Those are my four options. We send those into the cabinet in confirmation with the bishop, and so that's how all that's done. People always say, how did you get to stay in Hartwell so long? You get people in debt long enough, they can't get rid of you. Um, we borrowed three and a half million dollars and it's paid off. So guess what we got to do? We got to borrow some more money. That's exactly right. And we're going to hit you up for that next year. Um, that's the way it works in sacramental theology for churches. Now, the, the baptismal font is we believe in sacramental theolog theology that this is the point. That's why the amount doesn't matter. That's why the methodology doesn't matter, because we believe what God does, what God does is sufficient. Now, in ordinantial churches, such as the Baptist Church and others, that's why you must be immersed. They also require many Baptist churches, not all, but many Baptist churches require you to be rebaptized if you join that particular church. Now, we don't believe in rebaptism because we believe that what's done is done. But we do believe in a reaffirmation of one's baptismal covenant. You know, I ask people when they join this church, their baptismal covenant. As I ask you, do you believe in God? Yes or no? Do you believe in Jesus Christ? Yes or no? And do you believe in the Holy Spirit? Yes or no? See, those are very important. There are some people that say they're Christians that don't believe some of those things. And that makes no sense to me. Go be something else. Okay? Because that, you're in the wrong place. And I also know we're not the church for everybody. There's some people that this is not the church for them. That is the hardest thing to do when you get to meet with families. And they say, well, we want this, 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 this. And I said, we cannot offer that because we don't have it. And we are incapable of having that for whatever reason. Now, if you come to me with a mission, say, Gail says, I want to do a mission to knitters. You know what I say? I love that idea. Let's do it. You're in charge of it. <laughs> I had somebody ask me one time, we need Sunday night church back. That's what they said. I said, well, you know, I, I, that's okay. Um, you know, I grew up with Sunday night church. I said, can you be in charge of that and let's work on it? Well, no, I travel. I said, well, then if you're not willing to do that, then we're not going to do that. <laughs> so it's a give and take. It's a give and take. We believe in sacramental theology. That's why I said you come forward. That's why the elements are never served in the pew. Because that is the ordinential. That's, that's the ordinential way. The methodology of it. But for us as, as sacramentalists, we, we see the baptismal water is holy. Not because we've done hocus pocus over it. Um, originally, hocus pocus came from the Latin term. When the priest would um, ask God to... Uh, bless the elements of Holy Communion. And remember in the Roman Catholic Church, it's transubstantiation, which means the element of bread becomes what? Flesh. And the element of wine becomes what? Blood. Lutherans believe that too, by the way. We don't believe that. We believe that it's symbolic. We believe that it's symbolic. 
So this is holy water only in the nature of its symbolism. We don't believe that holy water has magic principles. We don't believe that holy water um, can save us. We are not saved through baptism. Baptism is an initiation right into the body of Christ. It ties into Old Testament theology. And what was the initiation right into Old Testament belief in God? What was it? Circumcision. Circumcision was this right. And so in our church and in the Church of England that we came out of and in churches like ours, we see baptism is the initiation right. It doesn't save you though. Remember when I've got a baby up here because a baby cannot answer for themselves. I usually lay a hand on their head if they'll let me without biting me. And I will say, bless this child so that when this child comes of age and accepts Jesus Christ as his personal savior may we be an example for him or her remember I take this child and I show y'all to him or her and I take this child to show her to you and I say these people are going to set the examples and I say don't lie to this baby will you by God's grace do everything in your power to be faithful persons so that this child may see Christ within you And that's really the congregational pledge for baby baptism. It's a shared responsibility, a shared responsibility. So that's why the water is up here in the sacred space. Um, Remember in the Roman Catholic Church, when you've got body and blood, you can't dispose of it. So many Catholic churches have a drain right behind the, the altar, and they dump the elements down that little drain. It goes straight to the ground. Um, Our communion stewards, after Holy Communion, they will feed the bread to the birds. A lot of times our children, because we use Hawaiian bread, we used to, remember those days? Our children love to come up here and eat the the elements that's left over. I love the theology of that. I love it. And see, then the juice, and the juice goes right out onto the ground, okay? Because we believe that after it's blessed, it becomes holy. It's not spooky holy, It's holy only in the nature on which it is used. This is holy ground. Why? Only because it's what's done here. It's no holy than anything other than the fact that people kneel at this altar and accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And if we're not leading people to Christ, we might as well not exist. The whole goal of the church is to lead people to a relationship with Jesus Christ and a relationship um, that is a progression of faith and belief in Jesus Christ. Are y'all with me? And so I ask you the questions of faith. I ask you those already. Do you believe in God? Do you believe in Jesus? Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? And do you profess publicly that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior? Now, if we say yes to all of those things, now, remember the devil believes in the first three. Um, It's the third one, the fourth one, that changes everything. And when you said that, millions of angels in heaven just sang in one glorious accord. And also all the people that we know of that have gone before us sang in glorious accord. Because we proclaimed our faith in Jesus Christ. And so what I want to ask you to do is, if if you feel comfortable, after the service, just come and touch this water. It'll it'll evaporate very quickly because it's alcohol. (laughs) But let me just remind you. Remember your baptism. That's what you say. Remember my baptism. And be thankful. I gotta hurry. I was not baptized as an infant because my parents were embarrassed. I was conceived out of wedlock. My mother was 17 years old, and my father um, was a sharecropper in Warren County. He lived on a sharecropper farm, and my mother was the granddaughter of the county doctor, and we were a Main Street family. And so when my mother became pregnant, it was a a scandal in 1965. I never thought of that until I was 14 years old when I was baptized. 
I was baptized um, by Frank Norris after I went through confirmation. I've told this story before. I was baptized by Frank Norris. It was his first confirmation class. He was nervous as a cat. And Philip Kitchens was right beside me, and he baptized me in the name of Philip Kitchens. He said, Philip Kitchens, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Philip Kitchens, I baptize you. And, and I thought for a long time, does Jesus know who I am? <laughs> Is God going to be confused? Hey, Philip. Hey, Philip. And then later, it dawned on me why, really honestly, why I wasn't baptized honestly as an infant. I understood that. It didn't mean my grandparents loved me any less. It did not mean my mother loved me any less. It was a situation of the times. But let me tell you, God is above times. And God has no favor among any of us because God loves us all the same. Every one of us. Just as much as God loves in our bulletin, we've got Jason Ford's interpreter and his family back in Afghanistan that is in hiding and scared to death. God loves them just as much as God loves us. And this is what makes the difference for all of us. Remember your baptism. And be thankful. And be thankful. So as we sing our closing hymn, I'm going to invite you just to come as you want to. If you don't want to, that's fine. <laughs> I promise you I've got so much alcohol in this. It's going to evaporate by the time you get to the front door. And, and a lot of times people would say don't do this, but I think it's important. So if you feel comfortable doing that, make your way and just remember. And if you want to do it where you are, you can do it as well. God bless you and thank you so much for God's grace that brought us here together today. Amen. Amen. Oh, cool. Cool. Thank you. Will you tell them that? table in the corner of there I have placed three pictures of this altar area. I keep them in the choir room if you would like to walk by and look at those to see the way it has looked through the years. I want you to go this week and remember your baptism and always, always be grateful. Amen.